sorry, about a year ago, the West Harris Trust uh, applied to the National Lottery Heritage Fund and were awarded £10,000 to take forward a national object project. The project was created to inform the and visitors to, to the area about the culture and heritage of the history of the area. The centre aimed to pass. Several events have been held during this course of the project, including talks, outside film shows, and school workshops. And the trust also invited Dr. Ian Robertson to do some research into the the West Harris land reading. I was lucky enough to spend a week with uh, Dr. Robertson down in Edinburgh at the beginning of the year uh, to watch him get on with his research and it was very interesting indeed. Uh, Dr. Ian Robertson is a reader in history at the University of the Highlands and Islands. He has published extensively on events of land disturbance in the Highlands and Islands and is an author of Landscape of, Pro Landscape of the Process of the Scottish Highlands after 1914 and later Highland Land Wars. <clears throat> and before I ask uh, Dr. Ian Robertson to uh, give his speak, I just want to say that uh, this gives me the opportunity to get a monkey off my back as my youngest daughter has been badgering me for years to get recognition for her great-grandfather and his compatriots who took part in the Scarister land raiding. So that is, that's that monkey gone. Now, normally I would ask Dr. Robertson to take the floor, but tonight, due to COVID, I would ask, ask him to take the screen. So Dr. Robertson. Thank you very much, Neil, indeed. And uh, thank you, thank you, one and all. And um, it's great to see to see so many people here tonight. And uh, rest assured, Neil, um, your, 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 your grandfather will get due recognition over the course of the next uh, next 40 minutes or so. Um, before I start, I, I have a PowerPoint, so um, I'm going to share that. And um, I hope we can um, I hope everybody can see that. Oh, curses. Hang on. Tell you what, I'll stop sharing because uh, you don't want to see me fiddling with my PowerPoint. And um, I will see if I can get it going that way. Ah, oh, this will be annoying if I can't manage this. Right, bear with me, please, folks. Right, I will now try to reshare the slideshow. And hope that you can you can see that now. Um, unfortunately, it does rather mean I can't see you. Um, but um, I, I think the slideshow is useful, so um, I'll, I'll continue with that. Alison, if we can't see the slideshow, can you just sing out now or tell me otherwise that you can see it? Uh, I can see it. Um, yeah, so it's good, good for just now. Grand. OK, that's really good. Thank you very much. Right. I will. Um, I'll make a start. OK. So um, tonight I'm going to be talking uh, about, as Neil has uh, absolutely correctly said, um, land seizures at West Harris um, in, uh, well, beginning in um, 1925. Um, before I launch into it, though, um, I must acknowledge um, the help and great company of the um, two trust board members with whom uh, I worked on the project, one of whom, Neil, who has kindly introduced me this evening, and also, I want to thank uh, Scott Bennett for his um, time and hospitality uh, down in Edinburgh there. Um, it was great. 
Um, I also should acknowledge um, the pioneering work of Bob Chambers here, um, the Centre for History's first PhD student and someone who continues to publish um, really excellent studies of our Highland Land Settlement Schemes. Um, a lot of the illustrations, not all, but a lot of the illustrations you'll see tonight um, come from then um, Bob's excellent publications. Now, tonight's talk is going to be split into three parts. Um, my focus is, of course, on the land raiding and land settlement immediately after um, Lord Leverhulme's trustees abandoned his development plans for the island in 1925. But I also want to consider the wider picture of the land wars, the land wars of which the raiding at Scaristaveg is such a compelling part. Finally, in the third part of tonight's talk, I will touch on what I see um, is the, um, the crucially important legacy, the crucially important heritage of land disturbances. That legacy and heritage being um, the community land buyout movement of which the West Harris Trust is such an important part. So, lots of ground to cover then, let's get on with it. In July 1937, a senior Scottish office official wrote, and there are the quotes up in front of you here. This was one of the most troublesome cases of raiding that the department has had to face. Settlement was only possible once we have bought Luskin Tyre. The official was, of course, talking about land seizures on Scaristaveg Farm, the seizures which lie at the heart of tonight's talk. Raiding had begun there almost a decade earlier. But even that, in 1925, even that makes it a very late episode of the Highland Land Wars. It is difficult, if not impossible, to be certain when the land wars began. Was it with resistance to clearance from the 18th century or the Battle of the Braes in 1882? And what about the period after the end of World War I? Was this a new era or was it simply an extension of the old? Now, all of these questions are somewhat academic. It is the reality on the ground that matters, and it is certainly what matters for tonight's talk. Land has nearly always been a contentious issue in the Highlands. Indeed, you might say that land continues to be a contentious issue. One that the recent Scottish land, form land fund decision at Warlock Head serves as testimony to. Now, in the late 19th century, that issue, the land issue, that issue erupted into the one, one of the longest running and most effective social movements for radical change yet experienced in rural Britain. The land wars began in the early 1880s, and they began out of land hunger and the feeling amongst crofters and cotters that they have been deprived of land that was rightfully theirs. The classic piece of evidence for uh, to quote here would be um, Angus Stewart from the Braes district of Sky. But that I actually suspect is because he was the very first crofter witness to the Napier Commission. So here instead, um, by way of variation, is um, is Samuel Nicholson. Nicholson said that even though Ben Lee had been taken from them, and here I'm quoting directly from the commission evidence, I can point out the shillings which the women had in my grandfather's time on the hill. And we were looking upon it, that Ben Lee, we were looking upon it, that we, uh, that we have foot upon it, that we have full rights of grazing. Sorry, I'm stumbled over that. 
It is sentiments such as these which motivated and drove the land wars on. Events at West Harris in the 1920s and 1930s were very emphatically a part of this movement. Very rapidly, events on Sky both spread to virtually every other um, area of the Highlands and saw the emergence of what to, was to be the most effective tool in the protesters' toolbox, the land raid. This makes its first appearance in Glendale in the spring of 1882. But by May of that year, the Braes crofters were, were illegally grazing their cattle on the lee. Now, the land raid was nearly always aimed at small parcels of land, land which crofters and cotters, landless, of course, the landless cotters, land which crofters and cotters often believed to be theirs by right and by economic necessity. Have land or starve, in other words. It was this belief, I've captured it here um, on the slide in front of you um, in the word duchas. It was this belief then, this ideology, this belief that gave their actions legitimacy in their eyes. It was a moral right they were enacting. In an otherwise deeply law-abiding and often deeply religious society and culture, it was the belief in rights to land, the belief that sanctioned and legitimized the act. Events at West Harris are undoubtedly um, part of the later land wars, the period after World War I. And it is to this phase of the wars that I now turn. In this period, the later land wars, in this period, we can identify over 400 separate incidents of protest. Some were small, perhaps a single, never repeated, written threat to seize land. Some, though, much larger. Those involving the forces of law and order, the courts and jail sentences. Scaris de Vegg falls into this latter category. Now, the majority, the significant majority of these 400 um, separate acts of protest are indeed written threats to seize land. But as I've said already, the most important protest form was the land seizure. Now, these were often highly formalized events, but they did not lack passion, they did not lack commitment, they did not lack persistence. Quite the opposite, in fact. Land raiders were often driven, as I've said already, but it's worth repeating, that what they were doing was simply retaking, retaking land that was theirs by right. Land which had been expropriated from past generations of their family, and which they, the present generation, had a right to through inheritance. In short, some raiders were simply retaking what was theirs. But there were other, more immediate motives to protest. In particular, World War I impacted on the land agitation in at least three important and distinct ways. I'd like to briefly pause over these now. First, the promise of land in return for war service um, was an important recruiting device in previous conflicts, and so it was in World War I. But this promise was not always honoured and caused huge frustration. Second, 
it was the actual service itself actually being away and in the war service that had the most profound and galvanizing effect on returning soldiers and sailors. This can be seen in two ways. First, it would appear to have created a sense of solidarity, a sense of solidarity beyond that forged of family, township, and clan. Second, any residual deference to old loyalties and old social systems seems to have been almost entirely swept away by war. As Finley MacLeod from Northton on Harris wrote in 1919, our dispositions are changed somewhat since the war began, and I fear we should never submit tamely to what our forefathers did. World War I, then, was catalyst, motive, and reason for protest. No question whatsoever. The land wars forced a governmental reaction with the traditional mixture, it must be admitted, of carrot and stick. Suppression and military intervention, stick, accompanied by land reform legislation, a carrot, beginning land reform, beginning in the 1880s and pausing in 1919, only to resume, I would argue, in 2003 and 2016. At the 19th century carrot, the acts, of 1886, typo there, sorry about that, the Acts of 1886 and 1897. The 19th century carrot wasn't juicy enough and the problem remained. In the 20th century, the government pretty much threw away the big stick and began to think and act proactively to solve the land problem. The Land Acts of 1911 and 1919 offered for the first time, I would suggest, the first time the possibility of just that, solving the land problem. Together, those two pieces of legislation, 1911 and 1919, were, I would suggest, momentous. They gave the Board of Agriculture the right to compulsory purchase estates. They gave the Board of Agriculture the power to create new holdings and the funding and administration to enact these most radical measures. Now, these acts did more than that, but these three critical things are, as I've just said, the critical things. This legislation was, I would suggest, truly and literally ground shifting. One example of the new um, attitude from Board of Agricultural officials comes from the long running and complex campaign from crofters in the bays of Harris to gain access to land on board of estate. And and the illegal grazing of sheep on the estate date from at least 1918 and probably earlier. In June 1933, the board's local officer reported how difficult and expensive it was to formulate a land settlement scheme on the estate. Um, Ian, we've lost your PowerPoint. I don't know if you meant, meant for that to happen, but just sorry to interrupt you, but it's it's vanished. <laughs> So you have, okay. Thank you for interrupting. Um, I will see if I can resume it. Does that work? Uh, it's a it's a green a green screen at the moment for me. Um, well, okay. that is very frustrating. Okay. Um, what I'll do is I'll see if I can re I'll stop it and see if I can reshare it, Alison. 
Grant. Bear with me, folks. Any luck now? Yep, that's it back. Grand. Oh, oh it's good. Except it's green again. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know if that's what others are seeing, but it's a, a green block. If you can if you can see just the green block, folks, just wave. Damn it. Okay. Um we'll try we'll try once that, more. That, that's good now. It's good um, now. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm not at all confident it's going to last, do you? <laughs> okay, well, anyway, we'll press on. Shall we press on? Where was I? Yes, yes. So, Board of Agriculture um, officer reporting how difficult and expensive it was to um, formulate a land scheme settlement on board. He also said that neither the applicants for the land in question were terribly suitable, and neither was the land itself. But there was an unsatisfied demand. And this, indeed, he said in 1933, was the last land available on the West Coast for land settlement. He concluded in the following terms. He concluded, however difficult the scheme might be to bring to fruition, it appears to me to be truly of the nature of land settlement for which the department was primarily constituted. There will be sustained and severe criticism, but the position can be met with sympathy, faith, and courage. This view and this sympathetic position could only have been won from this crucial post-1918 era. So, I've taken a fair bit of time setting out the context. Now, I'm turning to Harris and to West Harris in particular. Once again, there are a few things that I can only mention in passing. On Harris, agitation for land was often long running and complex. Even though it is generally accepted that Lord Leverhulme's purchase of the island in 1919 held, held back the tide of land disturbances seen elsewhere in the Hebrides, there is no doubt that um, active protest did in fact resume almost as soon as the war ended. And in 1921, um, land at Linger Bay on the East Coast was raided and remained with the raiders in possession until at least 1925. And 1925 is the key year. Leverhulme died. His estate almost immediately halted all development plans for the island, and very soon it was up for sale. We briefly noted that the pot of land disturbances was simmering slowly from the war's end. This abrupt change from development for nothing, this abrupt change not only brought the pot of land disturbances to the boil, but it boiled over all along the West Coast. Now, I should perhaps briefly note for those of you unsure as to why the West, well, that is the area um, that is the island's most fertile. It was the area also that people have been cleared from to make room for sheep and deer, some of whom have been forced to move to the somewhat different East Coast. With the gradual ending of um, the land employment, oh, sorry, a gradual ending of the employment opportunities offered by Leverhulme's developments, landless cotters were faced with a stark choice to emigrate or try to obtain crops. 
And in what they saw as a slow moving and unsympathetic board of agriculture, to try for crops, many believed, was to choose the land raiding route. In 1925, agitation for land almost immediately sprang up at Skaristeveg, Skaristevor, Olv, Orb, sorry, Silabost, Crago, and Luskin. And in the autumn of that year, in the autumn of 1925, an actual land seizure was thwarted by men working on Leverhulme's development schemes. Things intensify in the raiding season of 1926. There was undoubtedly a season to raiding. In March of that year, 1926, land in the Boer Deer Forest was seized, with the Board of Agriculture reporting, and I'm quoting, extensive trespass on the forest area in 1927, 1929, and 1932. This extensive trespass was accompanied by a boundary fence that mysteriously always seemed to be broken. This boundary fence meant that stocking, stock incursion onto the Boer of Deer Forest was, I would argue, a substitute for human land seizure. Stock could take the place of people because, and again I'm quoting, the present owner is not keen on stalking and has shut his eyes to trespass. The Borv is starting to bring us very close to home, very close to Skaristeveg. And now we finally arrive at Skaristeveg. As is the most normal course of things in the land wars, events at Skaristeveg begin with a written threat to raid. This was made, this written first written threat to raid, as far as I can find, as far as we can find, this was made on the 17th of August 1925. Others followed, other written threats followed in September. November, and finally in February. And in February, the exasperated correspondents said that they were going to seize land on the 1st of March. The planting and hence spring raiding season was upon them. And so indeed, on the 1st of March, 1926, Neil MacDonald and five other cotters from the area Five those. Neil MacDonald and five other cotters from the area, and I'm quoting here from um, their official interdict, five other crofters from the area and Neil MacDonald entered on the same farm, on the said farm, and began measuring off small holding. Ploughing began nine days later. But this crew were not alone. Indeed, there were multiple groups with eyes on Scaris to beg. Take Northton Township. Now, Northton Township was feeling hen hemmed in. When their neighbours were farms, Northton stock had free access to them. But both Kyle's and Scaris de Vegg were looking likely to be broken up for small holdings. As a consequence of any breakup, the land would be properly fenced and the stock, Northern stock, hemmed in. This threat to livelihood generated competing threats of raiding. And in March 1926, very much a gesture, but very much an actual land seizure on Scaris de Vegg. John McCouche, the main correspondent responsible for um, driving forward 
this particular agitation on Northton, there were others. Um, John McCush, the main correspondent, continued his campaign for access to Scaristeveg for the next two years. But it is the March, the 1st of March raid we are most interested in today. Once the very serious intent of the raiders became obvious, the proprietor moved to start legal proceedings. Thus was set in motion a series of events that was only halted by the then Department of Agriculture purchasing the Leskintyre estate in 1929. Now the raiders' day in court was delayed until March 27. On that day, they were found guilty of breach of interdict and sentenced to two months imprisonment. Politics now start to be a factor. In 1898, in 1897, in, <laughs> in April 1927, Sir John Gilmore, the Unionist Secretary for State for Scotland, restated his decision, and here I'm quoting, that the raiders are not to be settled under any scheme, either at um, Scaris de Veg or elsewhere. Now, this decision was a major hindrance both to the peaceable ending of the raiding and to the scheme that the board were quietly negotiating at the time. The four men were released early from Inverness jail. Charles McLennan and Roderick MacLeod ceased raiding, the archive tells us. But Ewan McLennan and Neil MacDonald went straight back on the land, and there they remained. Shifting in the spring of 1928 to cultivating with spades, and here I'm quoting, as no owner of horses will go to Scaris de Vague to play for them. At the same time, McLennan and MacDonald were fighting legal action, and this action reached one crescendo in June 1928, when they were sentenced once again, sentenced, one, sentenced this time to four months imprisonment each. On arrival at Inverness, Inverness jail, but, but Inverness town, sorry, on arrival at Inverness, they were met by a large demonstration in their favour, and at the end of the month, they were released once more pending an appeal. After several appeals and counter appeals, McLennan and MacDonald were rearrested in April 1929. Things then take a turn for the worse. First, John McCouche comes back into view. By April 1929, he had successfully obtained a croft on Scaris de Veg. Now this was despite his supposed raid in 1926. Remember that um, ban on land raiders getting land? This was despite his supposed raid in 1926 and his continual threats to do the same thereafter. Moreover, there was undoubtedly friction between the Northern applicants for land on the farm and the raiding cotters from Scaris de Boer. The, the croft that Makouche was meant to occupy on Scaris de Veg had in fact been so wholly occupied by the raiders. This is perhaps no coincidence. But now we arrive at the most serious incident of the whole conflict. The incident of the pea bucket. On the 20th of March 1929, Makouche attempted to supply his land and was prevented by the two raiders and their families from so doing. In April, he tried again, this time under police protection. By then, Ewan and Neil, 
were in jail in Inverness. But it made no difference. Their wives took up the defence. And as reported by a Board of Agriculture senior official, here I'm quoting again, it became a kind of melee. The women threw odious waters upon the ploughmen and they fled from the field. The ploughman is said to have lost his temper and struck both women. Other reports, um, other reports contradict this a little, but I love the image of a pea-soaked ploughman so much that I've kept it in. There is no doubt that as reported by Police Sergeant Alexander Stewart from Leverborough, and here I'm quoting from his report, a very serious breach of the peace took place. At the height of the disturbance, the two accused stood in front of the horses, swinging their aprons around their heads, shouting loudly and long, and Mrs. McLennan rattling a tin box containing stones. The women were not immediately arrested, but on the 6th of June were found guilty of breach of the peace and fined 10 shillings. The very next day, so a Board of Agriculture officer reported, McCoosh, and again, here I quote, McCoosh brought a pair of horses onto the ground and commenced to plow. Mrs. Neil MacDonald and a daughter of Mrs. Ewan McLennan lay down in front of the horses and McCoosh left the ground. And so it would seem that events were destined to continue. The two families had been illegally holding this land for three years and showed absolutely no sign of giving up or being deterred by prison. The mixture of carrot and stick I described for the land wars was not working here not working, I would say, because of the potent mix of an intransigent social secretary, sorry, Scottish secretary, an equally intransigent estate owner and his crofter. But then the political wheel turns once more. And finally, we get to the end game. The general election of June 1929 returned a minority Labour government. The new Scottish Secretary was William An An Adamson, and he brought a very different attitude towards Highland land issues and land disturbances with him. Within the month of him being put in office, the Board of Agriculture had been instructed to investigate the cost and practicalities of, quoting again, immediate compulsory acquisition of Scarist of Egg with a view to settling both raiders on it. Adamson also instructed the Board to do the same for the neighbouring estates of Leskintyre and Borv. It is obvious Adamson was considering a radical reorganization of land ownership and land settlement on the west of the island. And to get things moving, he sent his undersecretary um, to Harris to meet raiders and proprietor, a senior civil servant traveling to the Outer Hebrides, mighty me. Now this intervention, Adamson and his senior civil servant, this intervention changed everything. The proprietor agreed to halt his legal actions. The raiders agreed to accept land elsewhere on Harris. The impasse that only a few months ago looked like it was going to last for years to come, the impasse had been broken. 
the political wheel had turned once more. Now, settling the raiders on Leskintyre was Adamson's preferred option, and he pushed through the purchase of the estate in late 1929. Now, this purchase was, a government official admitted, impossible to defend. This, my apologies, I've got to my, it was impossible to defend the purchase on economic grounds, and it was an attempt to settle um, an acute agrarian question in Harris. Both Ewan and Neil were allocated holdings, although it actually took until 1935 for them to officially become crofters. Now, there is much more that could be said about that and about the history of the various land schemes on the West Coast. But that's not my brief for tonight. But before I turn to the final part of my talk, I want to um, offer one final point in relation to West Harris. Plans for a land settlement scheme on that Scaris de Vegg were far too advanced to drop, even if it did take ages to formally conclude it. For, by contrast, was purchased by the Department of Agriculture in 1933. While Scaris de began as a private scheme, but was gifted by the owner to the government in 1943. The communities purchased from the government in 2010 of Luskintyre, Thorv, and Scaris de and the subsequent consolidation into the West Harris estate was shaped by events of the quiet revolution in land ownership that began over 80 years previously. I just have a few minutes left, bear with me please. For my final section then, I want to explore the question of legacy. What has Scaris de Vegg, jail sentences, and ultimate land settlement bequeathed West Harris. What is the legacy of the Highland Land Wars on West Harris? The answer, though complex, is for me the same to each question. The first part of this um, answer is to remind ourselves that change sympathies both within and without government meant that land disturbances by crofters and cotters provoked a significantly different reaction to that occasioned by pre-war events. It is absolutely the case that virtually every one of the 400 plus incidents of protest which we find after 1918 caused the board to at least consider a settlement scheme on the disputed land. We've seen that very clearly at West Harris. Further, there is not one single significant act of land seizure that did not ultimately end in the land being broken up for smallholding. Here again, this is the case for West Harris. Yes, the raiders who stuck at it ended up on Luskin Tyre and not Scaris de Vegg. But the land settlement scheme provoked by the raiding on that farm did proceed. Here, I would argue, in one area, but replicated across the highlands and islands, here is by far and away the most important, enduring and positive impact of land disturbances on the highlands. The 1911 and 1919 Acts made provision for the purchase of private estates, quite remarkable in its own right. But even more significant is the fact that they, the Board of Agriculture, actually went ahead and did this, actually bought land and settled people on it. This, I would suggest, is little short of revolutionary. Whilst this process began with the contested District Board of 1897, 
the scale at which this effective land nationalization was deployed was unprecedented and its effects significantly long lasting. In some instances, estates remain in government hands and crofters remain their tenants. Here then is one strand of the legacy and heritage of land seizure. A second strand relates to the obvious fact that folks settling on the land needed somewhere to live. This need is captured quite eloquently in Finley MacLeod's wonderful memoir, Crowdy and Cream. This is how he describes arriving at the family's new croft for the first time. The view which opened up for us as we topped the back of Scarister Hill on that first day can have done little to lift my mother's, my mother's morale or confirm to her faith or confirm her faith in my father's optimism. As far as the eye could see, there was nothing but beautiful emptiness, save for the solid schoolhouse built in 1892 and church, manse and big house. Church, manse and big house were definitely not housing for crofters then. So when cutting out new crops, Board of Agricultural officials had to face the fact that there was nowhere for their new crofters to live. This had to be addressed. Rapidly then, the Board of Agriculture drew up, drew up plans for an approved new dwelling, many examples of which can still be found in the Highlands today. And even when there was an existing township to build on, or where crofts in existing townships were created, this still had a positive impact. In short, new crofts and new croft houses were created, new crofting townships emerged and existing ones extended and revived. Moreover, in imposing new housing standards for their new settlers, the Board of Agriculture played a critical role in ensuring the shift from the Black House to the White House in the crofting landscape. According to Chem Chambers, in the Hebrides alone, some 974 new crofts were created and 667 extensions to existing crofts granted. A new crofting landscape was the result. And yes, as time went on, folks became more discerning over the nature of the holding they would take. But this notwithstanding, there is no doubt that the consequences of post-war land disturbances was that some townships remained viable and some townships, some people remained in the highlands where otherwise they would have left. This is the legacy of illegality. It is a legacy and heritage very visible at West Harris. It doesn't stop there, however. In the late 1990s, the Scottish government, reacting to pressure from both within and out with the Highlands, put into train the series of events which eventually led to the 2000 and 2016 Land Reform Acts. Emerging alongside this project, and indeed playing a significant role in its birth, was the community land buyout movement. Now, I'm not going to detail the history of the West Harris buyout. Neither do I want to trace in any detail the connection of that buyout to the momentous events of the 1920s and 30s. But that connection is there, I would suggest. And I'd like to illustrate what I mean by reference to the Stornoway Trust, the first community owners. As with Harris, Leverhulme owned Lewis, and here too, he was forced off the island by land disturbances. He split up his vast acreage on the island and gave a large amount to 
the Islanders is holding became the Stornoway Trust. The lineage and gestation of the trust is obvious. Beliefs in rights to land begat land hunger. The frustrations of land hunger begat land disturbances. War revived and intensified the demand for land. It also opened up the way to the satisfaction of that demand. War begat land settlement. On the east coast of Lewis, in the new townships of Cole, Gress, Gress and Tolster, the consequences of this process is very visible to the naked eye. Those consequences can be seen also in West Harris. In short, there is a close, if not symbiotic, relationship between land wars and the community land buyout movement of some 70 years later. Acts of land invasion function as a heritage resource, a resource for and from below. In this instance, below means the local community, the local culture. A heritage, not exclusively, of course, not exclusively for, of course, but primarily for local folks. The sacrifices made by the West Harris scarest of egg land raiders being dragged through the courts, going to jail. The sacrifices they and their families made is one of the main reasons why there are people on West Harris today. One of the main reasons why there was a community buyout. It is, in short, your heritage. Thank you very much. In theory, I should be back. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Alison will control the, the questions. <laughs> If you have any questions, just switch on and let us hear them. If your volume isn't working to speak, you can pop them in the, in the chat. There's a little bubble and um, you should be able to see it along the bottom of your screen. If you click on the wee bubble and you can write in the chat if your um, mic doesn't let you switch on to speak for questions. Come along, don't be shy. <laughs> Look, can I, can I be heard? Yes. Yes, Morris McLeod, I'm in, uh, from Leaderborough. A um, very interesting talk. What, one of the things that I would like to know about is when Leverhulme finished off in Harris and moved out, what happened to the land? Did, were there new landowners? It didn't, you know, Harris must have, must, must have been bought by other people. You haven't yes, mentioned yes. who the landlords were during this moment of strife. No, no, you're right. Um, you're right, I haven't. Um, what, what happened by and large was that, um, particularly on the West Coast, um, the, uh, the individual farms were, um, were put up for sale um, individually. So this, um, in, in Leverhulme's time, um, Harris was all one big estate, effectively, with a series of farms and deer forests. Um, but um, the, 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 the trustees, having failed to find a purchaser for the whole of the island, remember, we're just about going into, into the time of the Great Depression, um, the, the trustees, having failed to find um, a purchaser, they, they decided to um, sell off um, the, the island in individual um, large lots. Now, um, as I've said already, on the West Coast, um, the trustees put up each um, individual farm, as it was then, uh, for sale. And um, very rapidly, um, a syndicate of um, local 
local, let's say middle class people, if you can, if you can um, say that, uh, a syndicate of local people came together um, to, to purchase all the estate, all the farms, sorry, um, in, in one lot. Now, um, the archive doesn't preserve the names of all of those um, members of the syndicate, um, but the, the, the person who eventually ended up at um, Scaris de Veg was a Mr. McClay. And in fact, his daughter, when um, a scheme of land settlement was um, enacted on Scaris de Veg, his daughter um, ended up with a croft there. Um, there is an awful lot of other detail um, around um, McClay's role in all of this, but um, I could have got, you know, had, had I tried to cover anything, I'd have gone on for hours and you wouldn't have wanted that. So McClay. And broke away from the syndicate because, um, according to Board of Agriculture's officials, um, he um, thought he could make more money out of um, the being his own proprietor, being a proprietor in in his own right. So it was Maclay at um, at Scaris to make. Um, I, I rather suspect Neil knows knows better than I do. Uh, the names of the the owners of some of the others um, from way back then. But before before McClay bought the the farm of Scartavik, he was the manager for for um, Lord Leverhulme. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he he was also um, a crofter as well, and then then a tenant, and then a manager. Yeah, he had a very rapid rise, did he not, Neil? Yeah. But thank you. That was a really interesting question. Um, Bob Chambers's book on um, on on Harris um, is is really good on Han Harris land settlement and and details some of those things that um, that I that I've missed out. Um, if if you like, I can i be really happy to do this. I can give the um, Bob's book is easily available all online. It can be bought and downloaded online. Um, although there are lots of hard copies around as well. Um, I can give um, perhaps Linda a link to, um, to the website for Bob's book and um, folks can, can pick it up from Linda. Would that, would that make sense? Yeah, sure. I think we've gone to our Facebook page for anybody who's interested. Grand. I'm, and Bob will be really pleased by that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Anybody else, any questions? No? Speak up now or forever hold your peace. Well, no, well, it just all that remains for me is to thank Dr. Ian Robertson for his talk and also the, the Lottery Heritage Fund for the, their, their support. So if there's no more questions, well, thank you all very much. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, Neil, and thank you, the West Highland Trust, first Harris Trust, sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.